Psychology and Medicine, and uh, we study a range of subjects here. Our discipline is primarily history, but we also work in the social sciences and in other areas of, of study which help us to understand what science is, where it's come from, what its role is in society today, how it's communicated, and what it means for us um, as a culture. So in this group, we have particular strengths in history of medicine and medical humanities, which um, Elizabeth's going to talk about um, in a little bit. We're also um, an important research centre for the history of industry and the history of technology. Um, that's uh, James's area, and that's something that's going to be covered by the History of Science Master's degree. James is also an expert in the history of computing, uh, which is another area where this um, centre uh, excels. We have several colleagues who work on climate change and the way in which climate change science has developed, how that interacts with policy and how we've come to live in a world where we think about climate change and uh, think about human behaviour and how all that goes. Another area we're interested in is science policy more generally, and we have an ongoing collaboration with the university's business school. So we look at um, new technologies, innovation, how that affects the economy, uh, what that means for our uh, lifestyle. And then um, another area is the popularization of science. So we may make a particular study of the public dimensions of science, both historically and in the contemporary world, and in terms of practice, how is it done? How is popular science made? What does it look like? And who are the audiences? So those are our range of um, subjects. We have um, the center itself consists of this corridor here, where all the teaching staff are. And there is 10? 10? Is it? 11? Eight. Oh, eight, eight. Okay. And then around the corner is another corridor where we have research fellows who are working on all kinds of different areas. One guy is an expert in the history of the relationship between people and their dogs, for example. Another one's written a book on the use of medical leeches. And there's a group working down there at the moment who are looking at the role of science in entertainment media. So they're looking at the Jurassic Park films and uh, uh, what uh, Big Bang is doing on TV and so on. So it's quite a mix of people. Um, it's quite a lively centre. We have lots of visitors coming. We have visitors at the moment from China and Denmark. So we get to hear from all over the world what people are doing. Um, we often hold conferences here so that you can see the best speakers from uh, all over the world uh, coming to talk about their subjects here. So it's quite a lively place. Um, we have uh, two groups of graduate students. We have our PhD students and we have our master students. This year there's about 30 master students. And um, we also offer courses to undergraduates at the university and they come from all over the place. And uh, Chris, is, Chris is one of them there. So um, plenty going on here, lots of people in and out. Um, it's a nice friendly group. I'm afraid we, we just are completely blighted by a building noise at the moment. And uh, every now and then we have to go through this uh, shouting over the top of the works. But um, do say if you can't hear at any point. Um, my name is Jane Gregory. I work on the science communication side. I'm going to say a little bit about um, that particular area of study in a minute. And next on the list is uh, Dr. James Sumner, I believe. Or is it Elizabeth first? No, next is James. He's going to talk to you about that. History of Science Masters. Okay, thank you very much, Jane. I'm just going to start by um, doing a few little preliminaries about the way the Masters courses work here. Right, um, who's a current undergraduate? Okay, so an undergraduate course, as you know, uh, the year starts in September and it ends around about June, so it's uh, a typical year is, is nine months. A master's is a 12 month course, it runs September to September. So all of our programs have that arrangement, all of them avail are available as either full time or part time. 
If you do the part-time route, you do half the courses at any given time over two years. And of course you pay roughly half the fees in each year. And the part-time route has been popular with people who've been taking on working commitments alongside their study. It's, it's a good way of being able to fund yourself through. So, all of the programmes that we offer have roughly the same principle. We start off with fairly general taught courses, introducing you to the field. We go on to more specialised taught courses. And as you move towards the end, particularly from around May, your full-time or your second part-time year, you will be doing research. There is a research dissertation or portfolio or project that counts for one-third of the total programme, 60 out of the 180 credits on a master's programme. So, um, we have three uh, pathways to study, History, Science, Technology, Medicine, Medical Humanities, Science, Communication. Let me talk you through what we do on the HSTM programme. Can I just ask, um, is anybody here actually an undergraduate historian? Is anybody here an undergraduate scientist? Is anybody here anything else? Psychology. Psychology. That has been raised as a question in the history of science. I think we can count psychology um, as a science. Um, so let me start by telling you what HSTM is not. It's not a science degree but with all the modern science substituted for old, um, archaic science that nobody believes in anymore. That would be pointless. What it is, is a study of the development of the institutions that we call scientific, the professional identities that we think of as science. And on this programme, we talk about those in terms of their relationship with technology, with industry, with medicine, with healthcare. So we look, for instance, at the development of things like this, the traditional lecture theatre environment. Can everybody see that properly? Okay, so this is, um, this is Michael Faraday. You all heard of Michael Faraday? Famous in the 19th century, uh, famous now, in fact, as a grand uh, experimental researcher in chemistry and electricity and various other things. And we ask questions like, where did this layout come from, this traditional lecture theatre layout with one man usually in the middle um, in a kind of a pulpit environment, that should tell you something, and people clustered around him. What is it about this situation or this man's credentials that mean that when he talks you've got to pay attention? That is actually quite an interesting question given that what he's doing here, this tabletop demonstration, is really not very much like what a research scientist actually does in the laboratory in the 19th century, and it's also not very much like what people do in industry. So where did it come from? How does it maintain its power? Because Michael Faraday stayed famous because he was a researcher. This is one of the big changes in the 19th century. The idea that to be seen as an expert scientist, you had to go out and do original research. It wasn't enough just to teach, to repeat other people's experiments, or to do sort of industrial consultancy, testing things, going through big long lists of tests, finding out the properties of various materials, for instance, without discovering new principles. So we look at where that idea came from, who promoted it, who promoted that identity, and why. Of course, that is public science. One of the things that you need to know is that um, before the 19th century, there was not so much public science about. A lot of um, scientific investigations, a lot of scientific demonstrations took place in private environments, um, people's homes, often wealthy people, of course. Um, this is quite a famous uh, painting by Joseph Wright of Derby. This is an experiment involving uh, a bird, which is rather unfortunately for the bird trapped in this this is called an air pump, and it's gradually having all the air sucked out of it. Guess what happens to the bird? Some of the audience, um, it's having quite a powerful effect on. They are rather worried, perhaps even traumatised by this. Some of the audience are not paying attention at all. This mm -hmm. pair of young lovers uh, over the other side, they are not interested in the bird. They've only got eyes for each other. Which illustrates quite an important principle, which is that you can't carry everybody with you all the time. So we think about who you manage to get on board in terms of building your authority claim, building your alliances, and who stays outside, and how that sometimes makes trouble for the development of what we might call the scientific 
establishment. Some people are resolutely unimpressed, or even worse than unimpressed, amused by the development of scientific ideas. So this is, um, this is an early 18th century cartoon by uh, the well-known cartoonist James Gilray, and it's satirising the work of the, uh, the Royal Institution. This man here is Humphrey Davy, who was one of Michael Far Faraday's predecessors uh, at the Royal Institution. So he was a public lecturer. You can see he's actually, he's helping out here. He's only a pair of fellows. The main lecturer here is a man called Thomas Garnet. And they are performing experiments on, uh, on airs, gases, as we would say. And they've got, um, they brought this, um, this is funny to the audience at the time because this is a real individual. This is a very sort of respectable and upstanding West Country squire. This is a guy with a knighthood, you know, a landowner who goes along to the Royal, uh, to the Royal Institution um, to try and cultivate his reputation as uh, a learned uh, gentleman. And he's being made to sniff all these gases. And in Gil Gilray's imagination, the result of this is that his trousers have exploded. Okay, this is about farting. Okay, it's not terribly sophisticated. Gilray tended not to be. This is often what people saw when they saw scientific authority. And the idea of imposing scientific authority by doing experiments, by taking people out of their comfort zone and showing them new things, is not automatically convincing to people. A lot of people will say, well, why should we do that? That's not normal practice. It's not commonsensical. It's strange. It's silly. These people are making peculiar claims. Of course, the movement that says that that's not what it's all about, and that science is actually very important and useful, has been fantastically successful. And we talk about some of the ways in which that success arose over the course of the 19th and then the 20th century. We're unusual for a historical group in that our historical frame of view comes right up to the present. So we look at what's going on now in the 21st century. We look at the big, for instance, developments in things like bioinformatics. Um, we have people researching here who do a lot of oral history, who go around interviewing people about relatively recent developments. Here's another cartoon. Okay, this is an image of Charles Darwin. And talking about Darwin and Darwinism, uh, because they're two rather different things, um, is one of the things that we do uh, on our survey course. Um, who's got a biological training? Okay, so you know that the nature of Darwinian evolution, evolution by natural selection, is branching. Right? You start out with a form, it speciates, you've got branches coming out all over the place. What Darwin didn't say was there's some sort of continual upward progression. But what's interesting is that when you look at cartoons about Darwinism, or about the figure of Charles Darwin, they very often go back to these earlier, um, often early 19th century ideas, pre-Darwin, in representing some kind of upward developing chain of being. And Darwin's image, because he was a very, very famous man in later life, is tacked onto it. So we have here, using the excuse that Dar one of Darwin's later books concerns worms, we have a worm gradually turning into a sort of monkey, which turns into a caveman, which turns into a Victorian gentleman, which turns into Charles Darwin. Okay, so we look not only at the development of the science itself, the content of the science, but at the perceptions of the science and the way that influenced the opportunities of scientific establishments. We also look at physical structures. Um, who's seen this? It's, a, it's, a, it's on Burlington Street. It's a bit difficult to see at the moment because it's all covered over, over in scaffolding. But this is the, what was originally the Shunt Laboratory. Now this was built in the 19th century, when there wasn't a university here. Um, and when there were not universities in many places. And where most scientific research went on in private venues. And Edward Shunk, who had this laboratory built, was a very wealthy industrialist. And this was his personal laboratory. And it was built at his home, up on the moors, um, above Salford. When the university was set up on this site, the laboratory was actually dismantled and brought down to what was becoming the university campus. So it's an extraordinary literal representation of that change. And one of the questions we ask is how we got from things like this to things like this, the Manchester Incubator Building, which you've probably seen on Grafton Street, these big sort of impressive, almost futuristic white tile visions 
of new scientific development. And what it means for a university to have an incubator facility for small companies, the idea that one of the functions of a university is to spin off these organisations and contribute to private enterprise in that way. That was not always what people saw as the function of the university. So, just tell you a little bit about the structure. Um, as I say, there's a part-time version of everything, um, but uh, I'll talk it through by way of the full-time. In your first semester, you will do one sort of general core course called Major Themes, which goes through, it's mostly 19th and 20th century, it's deliberately interdisciplinary, there's some medicine in there, there's some physical sciences, some technology and engineering, and there are a couple of skills courses, Theory and Practice, which tells you a bit about the history and theory of history itself, and research and communication skills, which is about how to read, how to take notes, how to write, how to present orally the way I'm doing here, or better, and how to work with objects. Uh, in the second semester, you do two specialist options, which I'll talk about in a moment, and in uh, the period from May through to the beginning of September, you will write your research dissertation. So, the options, there are three of them. Shaping the sciences, making modern technology, and medicine, science, and modernity. And there are various other possibilities that you may be able to take subject to approval. Shaping the sciences is really about developments like this. Okay, This is a development that didn't happen, which is typical of our approach. Um, you've all heard of the Large Hadron Collider okay. uh, at CERN, you know, which uh, with loads of uh, little protons whizzing around under Switzerland, fantastically expensive, revealing the secrets of the universe. This thing would have outcerned CERN had it been built. They started work on it in 1991 in Texas. This is about as far as they got. It was cancelled in 1993 because the money ran out. And this is an important point. It's all very well to say science must advance. Science costs money, and you've got to set priorities. Why is it that physics was once called the queen of the sciences in the 20th century? It's now had a bit of a fall from grace. And new biological approaches, as some of you will know, have, become, uh, have come to be seen as kind of a, the poster children of the scientific establishment. We ask questions like that. We ask where physics, for instance, came from as a field, where biology came from, emerging out of older fields which didn't have those names. Um, making modern technology is, of course, about very big technologies and very little and invisible ones. So big, striking things like this extraordinary heroic Soviet poster about the triumphs of the space program or Isambard Kingdom Brunel. You all heard of Brunel? Famously short man, about five foot tall, in front of the very, very big chains of one of his very, very big ships. So we talk about huge ships and dams and skyscrapers and all the famous things that people associate with the technological sublime. But we also talk about things like this, internet connectivity. If I pulled this ethernet cable out of the wall, it will become very, very inconvenient within a matter of a few minutes. Infrastructure, what we call infrastructure, is the stuff that you only notice when it stops working. So we will look at uh, that too. And medicine, science and modernity. Here we have a picture from the First World War of a soldier who is suffering from shell shock. Uh, now we have a psychologist here. So Shell shock, one of the um, defining um, modern uh, conditions of illness. And he's being treated with another kind of shock, electric shocks. So we look at the relationship between medicine and healthcare and the development of new forms of scientific activity and what that says about humans' relationship with science more generally. And finally, there is the dissertation. This is, um, it's usually an extended piece of work. The word length is up to 17,500 words. And here is a list of some of the topics that people have taken. You can see it's relatively specialised compared to the other things we do on the programme, but there is quite a wide range of opportunity to do things which may be medical, which may work on the physical sciences, or information technology, or a whole host of other things. Okay. Um, shall I hand straight over to Elizabeth to talk about medical humanities? Because that is, that is a very similar programme that has structural elements in common. In fact, they are formally they're two pathways within the same programme although there is also quite a lot of difference in the teaching. I've got, uh, I've got a little outline of the, uh, the medical humanities pathway there. Okay, terrific. Thank you, James. I'm Elizabeth Toon. I'm, uh, 
I'm a staff member here in the department, a historian of medicine, but I'm also co-director of the Medical Humanities Program, or Medical Humanities Pathway, which, as James has said, is one of the pathways available to people doing the HSTM Masters. And I run this in conjunction, <coughs> excuse me, um, been lecturing all morning, as some of you know, <laughs> so I'm beginning to lose my voice a little. Um, I work closely with my colleague Sarah Collins, who is in the medical school. She teaches communications and uh, uh, communications and diagnostic skills in the medical school. And we together work with a number of people from this department and other departments to provide a program called Medical Humanities. Well, what is Medical Humanities? An old way of thinking about it would be to think that its purpose is trying to humanize doctors and make them more sympathetic. Actually, medical humanities covers a lot more than that. It is the field that brings together different methods from across the arts, the humanities, and the social sciences to think about the practice of medicine, the experience of health and healthcare, and illness and disease. And so it's a very interdisciplinary approach to understanding what health, medicine, disease, and illness mean, what it means to live in a particular kind of body in a particular kind of time and place. And it asks people to be fairly reflexive and reflective in thinking about the experience and practice of healthcare. So what does that mean? Well, the way the class is structured, we start off with a major themes course which introduces you, uh, one of the things that makes our program special is that we've really anchored it in the history of medicine. So as part of your major themes course, what you would do is you would take, you would have a lecture each week on the history of medicine. And sometimes you take those lecture courses with the students on the HSTM pathway, because of course, there are many people in that pathway who want to learn about the history of medicine also. And Anchored on top of that, we have two different kinds of activities. We have seminars and we have workshops. The seminars, we bring together people from other parts of the university who do arts and humanities. We bring in people from drama, from classics, from humanitarianism and conflict response, from bioethics, from English and American studies, creative writing, history, art history, all over, basically, music, even all over the faculty of humanities who come and talk about how they use methods in their field to study medicine, health, and the experience of medical practice and healthcare. <clears throat> then we also have workshops as part of that major themes course. And what we do is we invite a number of practitioners, not just medical clinicians or doctors, but often people like genetic counselors, nurses, patient representatives, people whose everyday work is healthcare, who talk about how a more reflective, experiential-based understanding of health can be helpful for future practitioners, future patients, and anyone who wants to understand healthcare. So as part of that major themes course, we do a lot of reflecting on what health and illness mean. So part of what we do, I've brought in some examples which you can look at at the break, um, is that several students do portfolios in which they use art, creative writing, photography to reflect on the issues that they're discussing academically and in a scholarly fashion through the major themes course. Alongside the major themes course in the autumn, you will take theory and practice alongside the HSTM students, and you'll take research skills alongside the HSTM and the science communication students. And I know most of you are not here to, because you're interested in medical humanities, but one reason why I'm telling you about the program is because many of you who do the HSTM pathway or do the science communication degree may find that you want to come sit in on some of the classes and some of the activities that we do particularly if you're interested in issues around the history of medicine or around health communication and scientific communication. So anyway, in the second semester, what you do, you take the medicine, science, and modernity class, which James has described on the history of medicine, and you also take one course, usually in the faculty of humanities. 
So in the past, we've had students take a course in English and American studies. Shakespeare has been a very popular one. Um, some people have taken classics. They've taken drama, um, healthcare, ethics, and law. Anyway, the idea is that you use one of your classes to go explore how another humanities discipline besides history approaches questions around medicine. And then finally, over the summer, you work on your dissertation. And the dissertation can take several forms. There's a more conventional research-based dissertation, which may take the form of either doing an ethnography around healthcare practice, or it might be a question around a historical or a literary issue, some sort of investigation that uses primary sources and analysis of that type. Many people also uh, instead do what's called a creative portfolio. And what they do is they may do some sort of creative work that they assemble on a particular theme. People have done short films, they've written novels, they've written plays, um, made photographic portfolios. In fact, one of our former students um, got an award from the New Scientist for her photography, um, uh, some of which was part of her portfolio. And then accompanying that portfolio, they write an analytical piece reflecting on how they have approached this subject using creative arts and humanities. So that's the overall structure of the program. A few more things before I finish. Some of the people who take the course are actually their students in the medical school who are taking a year out from their clinical work. Um, often they're very glad to take a year out from their clinical work. But they take a year out and they see it as a chance to approach medicine from a very different direction. But you don't have to be a medical student to take this course. And you don't even have to be a medical humanities student to participate in the aspects of this course. Among the people that we've had, we had one student who did an undergraduate degree in art history and then went on to become a midwife and then came back and is doing, did her master's in medical humanities, did extraordinarily well, her uh, portfolio is here, and now she's gone on to do PhD work. Um, others that we've had, people who have been journalists have done this program, um, people who are interested in social sciences, all sorts of people do it. So it brings together people from a pretty diverse set of backgrounds. It's very interdisciplinary. It's not everyone's cup of tea, but it has something to offer even those of you who are not interested in doing it as a degree. Those of you who are interested in doing it as a degree, please do talk to me. I can tell you more about the program. I can also show you some of the kinds of offerings that we have. Finally, it's very amenable to part-time study, as are the rest of our degrees. We plan <coughs> when courses are offered to try and fit everything onto one or two days a week so that if you are working full or nearly full time, you can still manage to do one of these degrees as a part time offering. So thanks very much. Thanks, Elizabeth. Right, the next one is science communication. So, um, science communication has been something of a growth industry as a career in the last 10 years. You will find many organizations now involved with science, for example, have a press officer where they wouldn't have done before. You will find science festivals happening in towns that never had a science festival before. There seems to be a lot of science on TV. There's a lot of science magazines. There are lots of places in which science is being communicated to a broader public. Now, we think that that is something very important and significant in our culture, and that it has great potential to inform and challenge and change the way we live. So we think, therefore, it's a good idea if intelligent, thoughtful, responsible people do it, and take some charge of what it is that um, science is doing to the way we live. So that's why we thought this is something that we need to take seriously uh, in this department. So in recent years, we've set up this program in science communication. And because we're doing it in a university, 
we think it's really important to draw on whatever scholarship we can. So we now have a body of literature which is maybe 30, 40 years old, some of it a bit older. You can see some examples of it here. That helps us particularly to understand how science is communicated uh, to the wider society. We also draw on the much older literatures that we have from media studies, communication studies, policy studies and so on. So to study science communication here, you have to be a little bit of a historian, a little bit of a sociologist, a little bit of a media studies person. Lots of different skills um, come together in studying this academic content, which we do um, in the first term. We also, being in a history of science uh, centre, are interested in the history of popular science. And uh, some of us do uh, research um, in this area. One of them is Jeff Hughes, who you're going to be hearing from uh, shortly, who's uh, written in the, on the history of journalism. I work in the history of popular science as well. And uh, we think the history of science is very important to understanding the place of science in society now. Uh, there's also a history to science communication, as you can see. Um, uh, this is something that's... Um, has a, a tradition and a heritage, and we think it's worth knowing what that is. Um, also, because we feel it's important for someone who communicates science to understand science very broadly, in the first semester, the science communication students take the same major themes course alongside the historians. So there you learn about science across the full range of the sciences and through many different periods in history. So that's an important part of what we study. Now we're also interested in the many ways in which science appears in everyday life. And an important one for us here is museums and events. Manchester is full of museums that have science in, whether they're called a science museum or not. I mean, we do have our science museums, Manchester Museum just across the road. There's the um, uh, War Museum of the North, which is jam-packed full of technology. So there are lots of places where science is being communicated in a museum environment. And for many of those uh, museums, what you can see in there is not just uh, relics and real objects like this, but also demonstrations going on, um, video games, uh, visitors being invited to touch and play with things, all kinds of events going on, some of which are actually very controversial and we're looking at the politics of these. Do you want to have people standing awestruck next to giant skeletons? Or would you rather somebody be able to throw stuff around and look at lots of uh, big explosions and, and be excited by that? So those are the kinds of issues that we would consider uh, in a, uh, a course about this kind of environment, as well as equipping you to take a job in a place like this. So we look at all the different roles that go on behind the scenes of an environment like these, um, how those uh, events are designed, how they're written, how they're approved, how they're funded, who comes, what kind of experience the people have who come and participate in events like these. Uh, and actually we're finding at the moment that the uh, institutions around here are desperately keen to have our students go and, go and work in them and they're offering us internships and asking for volunteers and so on. This is very much a growth sector. Another thing that's very important to us is to study the media. And we find science cropping up in all kinds of places in the mass media and in social media. So we might look at um, this documentary being presented by a scientist, for example, and ask ourselves, what does that symbolise? What part does that play in contemporary culture? We're interested in uh, new media um, and thinking about how that can be used to disseminate science and also thinking about what role does it play in enabling us all to be communicators of science? Um, we'll be studying uh, newspaper uh, and news techniques. Um, we have a dedicated course in the second term about journalism, which is um, taught by uh, some of the staff here in company with working professionals. So we have people who are full-time successful professional journalists coming along to help you learn the techniques that could help you 
uh, contribute to this kind of media. And we're also interested in these uh, 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 new technique, techniques like apps for uh, monitoring scientific information. Some of our students are working at the moment with uh, uh, some people from the biology uh, department here to develop, um, uh, an, they're not developing the app, they're implementing an app that helps people with breathing difficulties monitor the weather conditions. And out of this, they're hoping to build a database that shows how the weather uh, makes it more or less difficult for people with conditions like asthma to go about their everyday life. So all these kinds of things are important to us, part of the uh, culture of um, science. We also have a very strong interest here in the politics of science. And in fact, we are working with the business school here, where the science policy lecturer, Dr. Kieran Flanagan, um, is uh, our contributor uh, on this topic. So we're interested in things like how uh, NHS spending data how is that decided? Who decides? What role do the people have to contribute to that decision? And then once it's been decided, how is that represented to us? How is that information shared with us in such a way as we feel part of democratic decision making uh, or not? I mentioned climate change before. We have um, uh, several colleagues who are experts in the history of climate change who are involved in discussions on climate change policy. So whenever you hear about these big conferences, I think Paris is the next one, or has that just happened? Gosh, are they still going to do that in Paris, do you think? Wow. Um, big conference coming up in Paris about climate change, and um, no doubt our colleagues will be monitoring that very closely to see what kinds of decisions the scientists are making, how the politicians are reacting to that, and how the press then communicates what they're doing to the rest of us and whether we um, react or not. We're very interested in activism, like these people here trying to stop the pylons. We have a good case study on our doorstep, fracking, and the various uh, ups and downs of that plan is on our doorstep. And if you would like to go and watch a fracking protest and write about it, we'd be very glad to, hit to see your... Uh, opinions. So all of these are part of um, what we study and then we often find that things happen in the world which draw on all of these different areas. So we might find in this story about Ebola that somebody is presenting it as an issue in microbiology, that somebody else is presenting it as a human tragedy, that another medium is celebrating the technological response and we'll all be seeing uh, what's going on uh, in the newspapers. I heard the other day that Sierra Leone has been declared Ebola free but at the same time there's one new case in Britain. So Ebola is now a British disease. <laughs> Sierra Leone's all right. Um, now, how do we cram all this in? Well, as I said, we do the history in the first term along with the other master's students. We also do, uh, in the first term, a course, quite intense course, on the theory of science communication. So it's a specialist course just for the science communication people. In the second term, we have our professional options. So you could choose from among courses on journalism, on museums and public events, on science policy, and on science communication research. Alongside that, you do a big project, which we expect to be a professional standard. So you set yourself a task. I'm going to make a short film. I'm going to write a magazine article. We get you a professional mentor, and you produce something of professional standard. And over the summer, like the other master's students, you'll be writing something which we're calling for convenience a dissertation, but which probably will not be a slab of paper with loads of words on. It might be a film, it might be a script, it might be an event. So some actual piece of science communication which you will implement. And then, because this is a master's degree in a university, you will reflect on in an intelligent way and critique uh, for yourself. Okay? The plan is that by the end of this course, you are much better fitted for jobs in this growing industry than before you started. 
plus you will have had an interesting time along the way, met some nice people, and had a chance to develop your skills in a timetable which is actually quite empty. The idea being that while you're under our roof, you have a space in which you can choose to learn in certain ways. So you can develop your writing skills if that's what you want, you can develop your performance skills if that's what you want, and we will provide you with the support to do that. Okay, um, I'm going to be around for a bit at the end of the afternoon if anybody wants to ask me some more questions. And I think Elizabeth is too. And um, we can also tell you about the history side. But James has to dash off. Um, we are now going to hear from a couple of current master students. And if Jer and Matt would like to come up here. And I say current. Matt has finished his master's degree, but he's somebody who's been through the whole year of the master's degree, and in fact he's just started a PhD. No, I'm, no not in January. I'm, oh. I'm, just, I'm just unemployed. I'm you're just, you're just, you have yeah, no yeah. status whatsoever. No, I'm just here because it's warm. Okay, and a free cake. Free yeah. cake. And Jair has just started, so they're going to tell you about their experience. Do you want to sort of say your more current one first? Then yeah, can kind of sure. Jump in at the end. Um, so I did biology, a bachelor's in biology at undergrad, and through my final year project, sort of noticed Chisholm, the department, and got interested in the science communication masters that way. Um, building on what Jane said before, obviously I'm not sure where you guys are from like background wise, but for me as a scientist, there's a lot of history there at the beginning and that I sort of struggled with that, but the, the support that you get from the little department is really, really good with stuff like that. So if you're a historian and you're struggling with the science and things like that, that you know, you can be helped to learn how to, you know, deal with the literature and things like that that you're not used to. And there's also the research and skills unit that you do that really helps with that. Um, the best thing about the Masters for me so far is the, all the opportunities that you get. So you do have those three days working at, in classes and then on a Thursday there's all sorts of trips where the, we get taken to museums and things like that and you get to see hands on you know, what's going on out there in Manchester which brings me to my next point is that Manchester is actually such a great city for science communication. There's so much going on it's ridiculous, there's too much going on to get involved in, to be honest. Um, but for instance, um, at the beginning of the year, like right when we first started, at the uh, Manchester Science Festival and European Science, uh, City of Science launch party was happening and we got asked to send a group there to do like live tweeting and uh, blogging about the event and get that out. So that was really good, we were thrown straight into it and it was great met loads of people like networking wise which is obviously really important in a science communication uh, career mm. i've got already building up my roster of <laughs> emails ready for when i'm looking for a job so <laughs> there's that aspect of it as well um and also if you do if you're looking at doing it next year you'll be right in time for manchester being the european city of science which there's going to be even more than usual going on um in terms of science communication and at, in the actual city. Um, I think that's all I really want to say. I don't know you have a part-time job, yes? Oh yes, because of the way <laughs> it's structured, um, I, I don't have a loan or anything like that, so obviously to pay for, to put myself through it, I work Thursday and Friday, but they make it really easy for you to do that with the way the timetable is. And, and I, I tend to my weekly routine is to sort of come into class in the morning, stay in the afternoons, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, to do work, and then I get to go to my job on Thursday and Friday and still have a bit of a weekend, which is <laughs> always nice. Um, anything else? Great, no, that's, that's fine. Thanks. And I'm going to shoot off. Okay. <laughs> Essay <laughs> deadline tomorrow. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Joe. No worries. Yeah, no, that's, that was actually perfect for what I'm going to say because I've got a completely different experience and I think that's one of the, the best things about uh, the department is you've got so many people with so many different things going on that whatever you want to do, whatever you want to talk about and whatever skill sets you sort of need to develop, there'll be somebody whose door will be open that you can stop into. Um, so my undergraduate degree was in American literature with creative writing 
i decided off the back of that that i wanted to do a ph d which was slightly more in this field so use the master's degree as a sort of retooling just to kind of get up the skills that i actually needed and as a space to do that in just an ideal i think in terms of all of the um all of the interactions that you get, all of the experiences. Um, Manchester as well. I've told Manchester's great for stuff, don't tend to go outside much, but apparently, you know, it's all there. It's raining, but it's great. Uh, what else do you need to know? We've got an office, which um, I've told most master's departments don't have, which helps a lot. So you've got bonding amongst the master's students. You've got these, you know, your cohort to help you out. Um, and in terms of as well, support for funding, if any of you are looking to stay on to PhD, um, Speaking to other master's students um, and other undergraduate students at different universities, I don't think there's the same level of support to actually send you off the funding um, if you're eligible for it. Um, so if you're, you know, there's AHRC, there's Welcome. I think you're talking about the funding this afternoon, aren't you? We are, yes. There we go, perfect. Um, so yeah, there's a lot. Is there anything that... Oh, in terms of as well, going on to all the programs. Um, so I did the History of Science one, but I attended the SciComm class as it was then, and the Medical Humanities stuff. And it really does help to have all of these things going on at once, sort of help develop. So my dissertation ended up being on the history of, um, of bird watching <laughs> as a kind of tangent to ornithology. Um, and that was kind of for folks. It was not as boring as it sounds. <laughs> um, yeah. Okay. Anybody got any questions? Yeah, any questions? That? I've not come prepared, so just throw stuff at me and I'll kind of respond. By the way, I'm not in here because it's warm. That was a lie at the start. I'm in here because Justin is open to me to come in and prep for a PhD. Another welcoming sign of this department. <laughs> <laughs> um, so you said you attended all the classes. Mm. So is it structured like that? All different times? Yeah. 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 Um, I, I can answer this. It yeah. is a little complicated. <laughs> and all the current master's students will uh, probably agree that the first week when they get the schedule with all the different things they can attend for the different pathways highlighted in different colors, they sort of go, ah! <laughs> because there's so much. But we really do, although there are some conflicts occasionally, we make a lot of effort to make it possible for people to sit in and go to different classes as they'd like. Because, for instance, let's take the example of someone who's doing the HSTM degree but let's say they're interested in the history of genetics. Well, they might want to attend the seminar that's led by a bioethicist for the medical humanities session yeah. and then go on to the workshop where we talk to a genetic counselor about how that person does her, uh, in this case it's a her, how she does her work and how she interacts with clients and with professional geneticists. That's going to be very useful to someone who wants to know about the history as well. So we do really make a strong effort for you to be able to dip into those other programs because while they are separate pathways and programs, they're all intimately related mm -hmm. and they represent kind of the diversity of interests and abilities amongst the staff and the students here. So that's another thing that makes Manchester's offering in all three of these fields really special is that you do one but you can always enhance it by doing parts of the others. Right, thanks Elizabeth, thanks Matt. Um, James no. is going to just say a couple of words about what our students go on to do afterwards. Can I suggest actually that we take the break now because I noticed that several of our lovely um, current uh, master's students have popped along um, so that uh, if anybody's got any questions you would like to ask them or you'd like to chat informally, um, now uh, would be the best time to do it and that we do that um, over coffee and then after we've done the little funding talk uh, in the second hour I will, I will quickly go through okay. that. Okay, would the lovely current master students like to wave so that visitors know who you are? Thank you very much. Right, um, please help yourself to a hot drink and uh, some strangely shaped cake. <laughs> okay, thank you very much and so, uh, what can I say about uh, where our graduates end up? Well, the first thing to know is that some of them go into general graduate jobs, whatever that might mean. Bear in mind, um, with uh, the kind of background that you get with any of these programmes, you will look to an employer to be somebody who's got some kind of competence on the scientific side, 
and some kind of competence on the humanities side. Specifically, uh, we expect our students to have skills of reading and writing, um, which are not traditionally taught uh, on most science degrees in this country, um, and which can be useful for various roles. But I'm just going to say something briefly about a variety of students who, who have all done something more specifically relevant to the themes of the different degree programmes. So, number one, this is Rosie. Uh, she was one of our part-time students. She was actually working as a recording studio manager at the University of Salford uh, when she did this degree with us. And rather ingeniously, she did a dissertation on the history of uh, recording studios, how the space is developed, you know, the acoustics, the technology behind it, the way the music industry was changing. And out of that, um, her employers loved this, um, so she carried on managing recording studios for a while, but she went off and decided she wanted to do something else, which is she became a technical author. Okay, so if you ever pick up the manual to a washing machine or a car, or in her case, um, specialist um, high-end uh, audio equipment, she's the person who writes those things, make sure that it's comprehensible. Anthony um, likewise ended up working with words. He specialised in library systems. Okay, so he's not the bloke who issues the books to you, he's the man who makes sure that the infrastructure, that word again, behind the library at this uh, it's a university uh, in New York City, um, functions and doesn't fall over. So he's directly using some of the skills of information management that he picked up uh, during that course um, in that role. Uh, Leah, um, one of our more recent uh, graduates, um, is now a public relations um, consultant working for a firm called Six Degrees, which specialises in clients in the sciences, industry, and engineering. And she, again, her role is mostly writing, writing to convince, which is something that we do focus on uh, on our programmes. Um, an earlier graduate is Edwin, Edwin Collier, um, who is uh, still around, based in Manchester. I see him at meetings occasionally. He has actually ended up in the position of running this entire little network, something that didn't exist, so he realised that he had to create it, of people who write um, on scientific topics at various lengths for various audiences, edit things put together by other people who may know about the science, but don't really know how to communicate with people who don't know the science. And likewise, um, some of this work is promotional, some of it is straightforwardly explanatory. A lot of it is the work of translation between different audiences, something you'll find out a lot about on any of our programmes. Uh, this is Rachel, who is actually now based um, back with us in Chisholm. She ended up um, going into the museum sector, which several of our past students have. So she was at the Science Museum in London, uh, again, specialising in, uh, in her case, technology and engineering. Um, she was a, uh, she's actually a maths and physics joint honours graduate of this university, I think. Uh, and so she would draw more to the physical sciences, technology, engineering, the information side, the communication side. So she spent a while uh, in a curatorial role. Um, this is her with Rachel's the one on the right. Um, this bloke works for the firm that produced the last manual typewriter that was made in this country, and so Science Museum decided to acquire that. That was one of her jobs, trying to think, you know, given that museums don't have infinite space, they're trying to collect all the important stuff, what shall we collect? And after a couple of years in that role, she actually came back to us and is now working with us doing a PhD on the development of Dollis Hill, which was the post office research station that did a lot of important work on telecommunications and related information technologies. Uh, another person who ended up doing a PhD, not here but uh, down at Oxford, Brooks, is, uh, is Kat, Kat Rushmore. And uh, she did her uh, master's uh, a while ago, ended up um, focusing on things, uh, ended up having a, a museum's role. Um, in her case, everyday objects were a big theme. Uh, which is sometimes unusual in museum practice, but it's become increasingly popular. And she's now writing a PhD on chemicals, not in the research sense, but in the use sense, the consumer use sense. So everyday chemicals and who was using them for what purpose in British homes. Uh, this is Gemma, um, who is a science communication graduate. Gemma has the kind of job that people like Jer will be looking for when, uh, when their time comes. Um, she was... Um, 
She spent a while working with the Edinburgh International Science Festival, um, doing, it's actually it's quite interesting, this was um, in the United Arab Emirates, there were sort of big, uh, grand plans to develop something similar, and she was one of the people who they flew out to um, develop uh, with various clients how to do that. She's now ended up, she has a permanent role at Catalyst. I don't know if anybody knows Catalyst. It's a science center in Widnes, um, and her role is basically managing a lot of the, uh, the public programs. She does a lot of work with children. Okay, so children's audiences, schools audiences are very, very big business for uh, science communication in general. And although it's a chemical um, museum principally, um, she has roles that are quite wide ranging. You'll find a lot of operations are fairly small in terms of the number of staff. So it can be a bit hectic, but it does mean that you get a very varied um, day to day experience. And finally, for this presentation, this is Duncan. Uh, he doesn't always look like this. Duncan, this is from uh, a drama production. He's playing the role of dead bloke number whatever. He combined his studies with us with getting quite a bit of experience in the theatre, uh, on the stage and behind the scenes. He did various things. He directed a few shows. He, was, he actually held the role of armourer on at least one production, which is the person who makes sure that all the guns and related equipment are safe. That needs a bit of technical know-how. It also needs the practical skills that he's now using because he is, like Gemma, he's working in a science centre, um, the, uh, the Centre for Life uh, up in uh, Newcastle upon Tyne, and he does similar things, you know, he works with schools. He also does evening events and he runs uh, various uh, activities for adult audiences as well. So overall, quite a broad selection of careers. I've only had time to go through that very, very quickly, but if, anybody, if anybody's got any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Okay, shall we move on? Right, thanks, James. So, and now we have Jeff Hughes, who is going to tell you about funding. Jeff is a lecturer in history of science. He focuses on the 20th century and on the physical sciences and also on the history of journalism. And he's talking to you now about funding because he is the director of PhD studies in Chester. Thank you very much, Jane. Hello, everyone. So I'm Jeff Hughes. Please bear with me while I get the hand pointer. So, um, I'm going to say a little bit about um, things that can happen uh, after the master's programme, so going on to PhD research. I'll just give you an introduction to that. But I'll also talk about the funding um, situation for Chistam, which encompasses both master's programmes and PhD programmes, because increasingly now the funding for one-year master's programmes is tied to a PhD programme. So it's regarded as a research training year for a PhD program by the Research Council. So I'm going to be talking about funding in that context. Um, let me say a little bit about um, what is research. So after you've done a taught master's, uh, a fair proportion of our students go on to do what's called a PhD, a doctorate in philosophy, uh, sometimes a master in philosophy, research degrees, um, which are original contributions to knowledge. I mean, as part of your master's program, you will do a dissertation which will involve some kind of research, and that will be a modest contribution to knowledge guided by your supervisors. But a PhD, a master, an MPhil or a PhD are full-time research degrees where you will work for one year or three years just doing research and you will produce uh, a thesis, which is essentially a major contribution to original scholarship. What's the point of doing that? Um, the point is uh, new historical research and new research in science communication can help to counter prevalent myths that exist about history and about science. There are lots of myths about science and how science works in our society, like, for example, the idea that there is a scientific method that drives the way science goes. There isn't a scientific method. Historical research has shown that. There is no single scientific method. So that's an important way of countering things that are commonly believed 
about science or about the past. Um, there's the excitement of working with original historical or science communication materials. So uh, I've given you at the top right there uh, just an example from my own recent research, which has been about um, Winston Churchill and his engagement with nuclear scientists at the end of the Second World War, when 30 British scientists were invited to a big conference in Moscow. Um, and this was just before the atomic bomb was tested. And the civil servants pointed out to Churchill that at least one of the scientists who'd been invited to go to Moscow uh, knew about the secret of the atomic bomb. And they were afraid that that person would spill the beans in Moscow and tell Stalin's scientists all about the atomic bomb, which hadn't yet been tested. And Churchill personally banned eight British scientists from travelling to Moscow. And this is uh, a letter from the National Archives in Kew, initialed by WSC, Winston Churchill, with a handwritten memo from Churchill to one of the civil servants saying, I don't have to do this, but we're going to have to stop these people going to Moscow. So there's a, um, limitations to scientific freedom from the very top. So I was quite excited when I found that, and I found one of Churchill's famous Action This Day minutes relating to this. So that's quite exciting when you get to do that kind of stuff. Um, it's transferable expertise. The kinds of skills that you develop on the master's program and then in more depth on the PhD program are transferable skills. You, research is needed in lots of um, jobs and occupations outside of academia. They're needed in many fields and they're valuable skills to develop. Um, a PhD is necessary if you want to go to uh, an academic career. Indeed, a number of our colleagues on the staff in this corridor started as just um, master's students, stayed on here to do PhDs, and are now teaching on the staff here. Uh, which is, not many places can say that, I think, that's quite an achievement. And it's often an advantage in other fields. So, for example, if you wanted to go and work in the Science Museum in London, these days, a PhD is a real advantage. They're now looking to recruit people with PhDs as curators. Um, the kinds of projects that we currently have going on as PhDs here, they have the same kind of diversity that James showed you with master's dissertations. So James has a student working on um, spaces of industrial heritage, particularly the Liverpool Road site of the Museum of Science and Industry in Manchester. And she's working on a project that is jointly sponsored by the Science Museum, the, the Museum of Science and Industry, which is interested in its own site. It's the first time that it's getting an understanding of its own space. Uh, people working on the history of the Medical Research Council, one of the big um, uh, research councils in Britain, one of the big funding authorities. Um, I have a student just finishing on the history of the electrical company Siemens, uh, which you may know from down Princess Parkway. Um, they have co-sponsored a PhD on the history of Siemens, and particularly in the north of England, since the Second World War. Uh, another student working on the British Space Programme, and the attitude of the Wilson government, particularly in the 1960s, which used the idea of a British Space Programme as a way of linking Britain to Europe, and of um, trying to get Britain into the European economic community. So science and politics and technology all go together. And there are various other examples. There's a huge range of stuff going on here. If you look at the Chuston website, all of the PhD students are listed, and you can see what their projects are and, and who's funding them. Just a few examples, again, careers, what people have gone on to. Um, a lot of people go on to academic careers here or elsewhere, and a PhD is, is necessary for that. But you don't have to become an academic with a PhD. Uh, Melissa was one of my PhD students. Uh, she was working on the history of British civil defence in the nuclear age and looking at home office files about um, how you could protect the population against nuclear attack. Um, as part of her PhD funding from the Economic and Social Research Council, she got the opportunity to go and work for three months on a secondment in Whitehall. So she was working uh, with policy advisors in, in Whitehall. Uh, she liked it very much. They liked her. So that when she finished her PhD, she was invited back to carry on the policy advice work. And now she has joined the civil service, and she's a high up policy advisor in, I think she's in uh, environment and climate change 
Um, she's using the skills that she developed in a PhD here now in government policy advice. Tom was one of James's PhD students. He came to us from the University of Kent to do a PhD here. Got a master's in Kent, then came here. Uh, his PhD was on the first generation of home computers in the 1980s. Tom has gone on to become um, an interviewer in the Oral History of British Science project at the British Library. And he spent a lot of time interviewing eminent scientists and engineers all around Britain about how British science and technology developed in the last 50 years. And what he's doing is creating a permanent sound archive at the British Library. You can go on the British Library website and listen to the interviews that he's done with all these people. And again, his PhD training here has informed the way that he approaches this work. And Paul Marshall, um, another of James's PhD students. Paul already had a successful career in the electronics industry. He's a very successful designer of flight simulators. Um, and he wanted a bit of a break from that, and he was very interested in the history of electronics and television. And so he came here and did a PhD on the early history of television, uh, which has opened lots of opportunities for him, not least because, as a sideline, he runs um, a sort of private television museum around his home. And now he has a very successful enterprise supplying um, old television and electronic equipment to things like film production companies who want to recreate old settings of, um, that, that use old TV equipment. So, for example, in the recent um, program, The History of Doctor Who, that recreated the first episodes of Doctor Who, Paul was actually supplying a lot of the equipment from the 1960s that they were using in that documentary recreation. So, a sort of range of things that people have gone on to after PhDs at Chisholm. So let me tell you a little bit about what research degrees there are. <clears throat> there are two. There's an MPhil, Master of Philosophy, and a PhD, uh, Doctor of Philosophy. The MPhil is a one-year full-time or two years part-time freestanding research degree. It involves writing a 50,000-word original thesis. Um, it can be a probationary first year of a PhD. So if, if you or we were unsure about whether you wanted to continue onto a PhD, if you wanted to get a sense of if research was for you, you could register for a one-year MPhil research degree and then decide during the course of that year whether you wanted to continue for a further two years complete a PhD or whether you just wanted to take the MPhil as a freestanding research degree. Uh, the PhD itself is a full-time three-year degree or six years part-time and that involves an 80,000 word thesis and all the staff here have completed these 80,000 word theses and it's a bit of a grind sometimes but it's really worth it because you become the world expert on whatever it is that you have to be searching. <coughs> um, to be admitted to uh, an MPhil or a PhD program, you will usually need a very good Masters, uh, MSc or MA in HSTM or SciComm or some kind of related field. History, uh, we accept, sociology, we accept. As long as the field uh, and your experience have some relevance to what you want to do and have provided you with some sort of skills, that's fine. And we, we can discuss what further skills you need. In general, you would need to think about a researcher proposal, um, outlining what your project would be, what the topic would be, what your research questions would be, and what the existing literature in your area is. In other words, is there, um, is there a PhD to be written about your topic? The research proposal needs to establish that. <clears throat> and you need a supervisor. You need to have identified somebody on the staff here who could supervise you, who could work with you and mentor you for one year or three years in this original research project. <clears throat> uh, okay, so there are two processes that run in parallel if you want to think about applying for a research degree after a master's program. Uh, the first is the formal application for a place at the university on the PhD program. That's fairly straightforward. Um, the, the application form is online at that URL. You need the research proposal 
uh, which you would discuss in advance with your prospective supervisor before you upload it onto the form. You need a couple of academic references. If you've done the master's program here, then the program director and somebody else on the staff can supply those references for you based on your uh, performance on the master's program. And you would need to upload a CV and transcripts of your undergraduate and your master's um, activities. And then there'll be an interview with the postgraduate tutor, uh, which is me. And that's always very friendly and straightforward, so that's not never really a problem. So the, the applying for a place is actually fairly straightforward, and you get a response, you get an answer very quickly as to whether we'd admit you to the PhD program. <clears throat> the trickier part is uh, fun getting funding for PhDs, and this is where funding for master's programs comes in as well. Uh, simply because of the way the research councils and the fund public funding situation is generally in this country at the moment, uh, it's very, very competitive. It's, it's quite difficult to get funding for a PhD program and for uh, a master's program. Uh, it's important to say, I'm going to, I'm going to run through some of the options in a minute, but it's important to say that for most of the funding applications that you would make, you need already to have been offered a place on the master's program or the PhD program for which you're applying for funding. So you need to get the place application going very early, the funding application will then follow once you've been offered a place. Okay. Are there any questions so far before I run through this mess of material? Do you have any questions? Okay, this looks a bit intimidating, uh, but it's actually quite, uh, sorry, it's actually quite um, straightforward. So, ignoring the detail for a moment, there are essentially um, three major routes for funding uh, for masters and PhD programs in HSTM, uh, basically three research councils. So, the Economic and Social Research Council, the ESRC funds um, one-year master's programs which are preparatory to a PhD program in areas that are broadly um, economic and social history, social studies, social history of science, science communication. Those would come under the Economic and Social Research Council. Master's awards need to be tied to prospective PhD. These are what they call one plus three applications. So if you were looking for a master's funding application in ESRC, you would also need to be applying prospectively for a three-year PhD. Okay? So if you are thinking about doing that, you need to talk to prospective supervisors about what your research proposal might be. Okay? Um, the deadline for September 2016 start. For the application is the 1st of February in 2016. It goes through a rather convoluted panel procedure. Um, in order to meet that deadline and submit all of the proposals and everything that need to go in and the references, you would really need to be talking to a prospective supervisor of both the master's dissertation and the PhD dissertation well before Christmas. So that by January you have fairly well advanced plans for your application for the funding. Okay? So with all of this stuff, the sooner you talk to people and staff here, the better, really. Okay? Um, the second research council is the Arts and Humanities Research Council. And like the ESRC, the University of Manchester is now in a consortium with other universities as far as these research council funding go. And Bids from inside the University of Manchester compete with bids from Lancaster and Liverpool and so on. So it's, it's quite a complex procedure. Um, the AHRC funding would be more for intellectual history than social history. Again, talk to members of staff. We can advise you which research council is best for the sort of research that you have in mind. Okay? Uh, the deadline there is the 12th of February, so that should be 2016. Um, and a similar thing applies. The AHRC will fund masters, a master's year, but it has to be tied to a three-year PhD to follow. 
and the master's year is regarded as training for the PhD. Um, there are occasional other awards that come up from both of these research councils, sometimes in collaboration with external sponsors of research, so like the one with Siemens that I mentioned earlier on, or like the one with the Museum of Science and Industry. Um, those are uh, rather specific and based on uh, either particular students' interests or particular staff interests, and we sometimes advertise a studentship like that. But those are uh, the exception rather than the rule. Uh, and finally, the Wellcome Trust. The Wellcome Trust sponsors uh, research in the history of medicine and medical humanities. Um, each year we get to make one application to the Wellcome Trust for a master's studentship in the history of medicine or medical humanities. Usually we decide on the basis, we invite applications from prospective master's students and we have an internal review of the applications to decide which one we put forward is very, very competitive. Um, the Wellcome Trust also supports three-year PhD studentships in the history of medicine and in medical humanities. And again, um, those aren't one plus three. They're not like the ESRC and AHRC ones. So you can apply for those once you're embarked on the master's program and you've decided that you want to go on to do PhD research in the history of medicine and medical humanities. Okay, there are some other um, possibilities, but they're sort of few and far between these days. All the details will be on our website uh, there where you get further information about the deadlines, uh, the scope of the various awards, and so on and so forth. Are there any questions about all of that? The essential message is talk to members of staff here if you're interested in applying for any funding because we can give you advice appropriate to your case. Okay, um, so just as you had a chat with current master's students, um, we've got some current PhD students in for you to see and have a chat with about what it's like to do a PhD. Do you guys want to come up yeah, sure. and say hello? <clears throat> so this is Andrew and this is Joe. Uh, do you want to each explain what you're up to and why? Yes. Uh, why? Well, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I ask myself every day. That's on video. Um, yeah, my name is Andrew Ball. I'm a third year PhD student and I'm broadly looking at um, changing kind of ideas, uh, meanings, and practices behind um, the humane treatment of animals in modern Britain, we shall argue. Um, and I came to um, Chiston because. I come from a background of modern um, social and cultural history. Uh, but I came to Chiston because I thought the history of science, technology and medicine, I could ask different questions about um, these matters that would be different from a straightforward uh, social and cultural history. Um, and I also get to integrate the history of science, technology and medicine. Um, I came through the path where I um, registered for an MPhil, Potentially could be my supervisor, had talks and interviews with Jeff. Um, and then during that MPhil, decided that I'd like to do a PhD and also secured funding with the ESRC um, as part of a collaborative doctoral award with the Humane Slaughter Association. Um, and that is. Uh, hello, uh, my name is Jiao Song. I am also a third year PhD here. Um, I came by a slightly more convoluted route. Um, I did a uh, Master's in Science Communication at the University of Kent, uh, and then I started on my PhD project with the School of Arts, Languages and Cultures, which is across the road. And I compare how political and social factors affect the communication of physical sciences in museums in the UK and China. Um, so I started with Chinese studies um, at Salk and then I moved over here because there is more, um, because I was jointly supervised uh, to begin with um, and 
just because I've always been interested in science communication, so it made sense for me to uh, be jointly supervised with uh, this department here. Um, I am on an ESRC case award as well, um, which was supposed to be with the Museum of Science and Industry, but now instead, um, because that got absorbed into the Science Museum Group, so it has also provided me with the opportunity to work with um, this big family of museums, um, which is interesting for someone who's <coughs> sort of equally interested in uh, academia as in the actual practical aspect of what my project entails. Yeah. Well, PhD life, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, in relation, I remember when I did my, mas my master's degree in a different institution, um, it's also the Department of History. Um, I wouldn't be aware beyond basically my uh, tutor and thesis supervisor of staff and postdocs and PhDs even. Um, here, it's a lot tighter than I remember. I'm not going to say where I did my master's. Uh, but you tend to know everybody from the corridor and we have seminars and things like that. And that's a real kind of important point. Um, and, and, and it's not um, in all institutions, in all departments. And it's a, it's a good point uh, with Chisdom. Um, also, for PhD level, we have our own office. There's currently 15 PhD students, um, so a healthy cohort. Um, but we have our own shared office, and we get, each get our own desk as well. And the office smells of coffee, so there's lots of coffee consumed um, permanently. Um, and um, in the last year, year and a half, I've also, as part of this kind of integrative uh, structure, um, we mentor master's students as well, so you'll be assigned to a PhD, um, which is more of a kind of informal relationship, but we generally explain it as if there's something, something that you don't want to ask, <laughs> either uh, a, a, super, a thesis supervisor or a tutor or whatever, you can come to us um, for um, whatever advice, if we can give it. But I've also, in the last year and a half, myself and another PhD student, uh, Erin Beeston, um, have coordinated a lunchtime seminar group, which all master's students are required to attend. And they're just 20-minute um, talks that are based on uh, works in progress. Um, all Chisholm PhDs have to give a talk uh, once, once, per, once a year for this, but we also get um, people from other PhDs from around country, or maybe even overseas, um, to give a talk as well. Um, and they're useful as well, I think, for master's students, because um, when it comes to conceiving of your, uh, your dissertation or your thesis, um, I think it helps you kind of ground your ideas, even if it's in a completely unrelated field. Um, and you'll have to give presentations yourself as well, which I believe are assessed. Um, and so seeing how people put these kind of early days ideas out there to an audience, I think is helpful for you as well. Yeah. We also come from, I think regardless of how our, the numbers of PhDs have gone up and down during the years that we've been here, there's always been quite a good mix of people coming from uh, social science history and um, natural science backgrounds. So if anyone is in a position where they feel like they might be on, on, on the margin of, or considering whether or not this is where they want to go, so that it's um, certainly I can't decide for you, but mm -hmm. it's uh, certainly something that you can consider, <coughs> and no one, everyone is we generally feel quite welcome here. Um, and in addition, because we're usually compared to the other pockets of um, histem PhDs around the country, because it's quite a large cohort, so there is a thing as these are the Manchester students, and there's about eight of us turning up at all the conferences. Um, so, so we already have quite a lot of links with other departments around the country um, that we are happy to pass on to future students so that there's like a nice little supportive network. Not that the supervisors aren't supportive, but, um, but so that you can easily get to know other people who are in um, a similar position as you are. I was going to ask, can you just say a little bit more about 
um, the Tristan postgrad community and the wider world, maybe particularly the SHS? <laughs> I was thinking who were going to make me talk about the BSHS. Um, I, I feel like one of you should talk about the BSHS. Joe's very powerful Actually, in the British society. I'm not, I'm not that powerful. I'm you quite are. powerful, yeah. yeah. Um, but... No, sometimes I don't actually want people to know about this because then they'll try to make me do things. Um, but I think in, intrinsically, somehow, uh, this department is also well connected within the world of these learned societies, which sounds a little bit like a relic from the 1940s. Um, uh, but societies that, uh, on one hand, are quite useful in, in terms of funding, if beyond your basic sort of um, living and tuition expenses if you want to attend a big conference that's in, in the US or there are upcoming ones that are in Rio, so that's one of the perks of being in the field. Um, uh, so like the IHR and the British Society for the History of Science, they have these pockets of funding that you can apply for that will get you like the extra so and so many hundreds of pounds uh, to the conferences. Um, and in addition, most of these societies, they also organise their own conferences uh, that are quite well attended by us, I would say, as a department, not just students. Um, yeah, and I guess the, the easy example would be um, the BSHS Postgrad Conference, which is sort of organised by students, for students, sometimes dubbed the, the kiddies party and no academic staff are allowed, um, but it's usually, at least four PhD students of this department, it's usually the first conference that you go to and you can swap ideas with other PhD students around the country and sometimes from further afield. Um, I don't know if, that was, if that's what you were angling for, yes, um, uh, but yes. And what about um, life in Manchester for a student? Well, I'm going to a gig tonight. Um, I don't know. Well, I know Manchester has previously been referred to as a good deal for students because there's more housing than... or the, the portion of housing to students is decent. Why are you looking at I'm just checking the weather. <laughs> um, it's decent compared to other places in the country, and that's what keeps the costs down a bit. I don't know if that's too financially minded for me, but there's, for those of you who are based in Manchester, you must have seen Manchester Academy across the road and um, how loud it is. Um, but yes, I, I feel like, to be honest, a lot of time I feel like there's a lot going on in Manchester and I only go to a fraction of it. But you're just nodding, you're not saying anything. Yeah. I agree. <laughs> oh, but there are. If, if I've you, never felt like. Yeah. But if, if we're angling still for the history of science, we do have several members, both of, of staff and of students, where there's um, history or uh, SciCom stand up that we also take part in and encourage attendance or to show that it's not all textbooks or reference books all the time. I feel like I should go, we do have lives, but <laughs> because now it doesn't sound like it. Thank you guys. Does anybody have any questions yeah. for the live real PhD? Okay, thank you both very much. Thank you. Right then, now that is the end of our formal business. Oh, I haven't done the fees bit, Jane. Oh, okay, that's very important. Right. Let's do this quick. Yeah. Yes. <coughs> Okay, this won't take long because Jeff's already covered most of this, but um, for the taught masters, these are the fee levels for the coming year. As you can see, the part-time fee is half of the full-time, and then the following year that will be, it will be about the same, it will be slightly higher for the second half. And in terms of um, being able to pay those fees, um, as undergraduates, you probably know, uh, those of you who are UK students, you know about the loan system. Um, there has not historically been any loan system at all for postgraduate talks, I'm afraid. 
um, there is, we are expecting sometime soon the definite details of the scheme that is supposed to be coming in for the coming year. It was announced um, 12 months ago in the, in, in the 2014 autumn statement that there was going to be such a scheme. Um, we're still waiting for the details. The most we know is that it will probably, the maximum will probably be £10,000. Will probably be restricted to students under the age of 30, and there will probably be an income based repayment system, something like what currently exists for undergraduates. So, if you think about that, the fees are £8,000, the loan will be up to £10,000, you would still have to find some means of covering most of your maintenance uh, to pay one of these loans out. Okay, um, there are other options. Jeff has talked about the, uh, the various funding council schemes. One thing I would emphasise, sometimes students come to us and say, if I, what I really want to do is the masters, but if there's only funding available for masters plus PhD, could I think about maybe doing a masters and a PhD for the sake of having a funded project? And the answer is, no, don't do that. A PhD is a very, very big life commitment you should only be looking at PhD route if you are serious about the PhD as an end in its own right. Unfortunately, there is very little full-scale funding for standalone masters. Although the Wellcome Trust, which is restricted to the history of medicine and the medical humanities, does still fund on that basis. It's the only regular source of funding that does do that at the moment, I'm afraid. Also. Uh, one thing which um, this is only just being confirmed, so it's not on the website yet, it'll be going up very soon. Uh, Chistam has a couple of internal studentships which are available for projects in the history of uh, the biological sciences and or medicine and healthcare, broadly considered. That, though, is on the same basis. Okay? The master's version is available if you, are, if you have plans to go through to PhD and you, you want to use the master's year as research training year. Um, so how do people pay for master's study? Um, many people now self-fund, and as we've been saying, the part-time route is an option that, that a lot of students have made use of. So studying part-time over two years, supplementing um, an income uh, from a job that they're carrying on at the same time as the master's. And the course is in fact flexible enough that, as Jair does, you can do some amount of um, paid work whilst taking the full-time version. That's demanding, but it's possible. People have done it successfully. Any questions on that? Okay, thank you very much. Excuse me, thanks. Right, thanks to James. Um, James has to dash, but the rest of us are around, so if you would like to ask any further questions about... Oh, and I should just say, I'm available on email, and you can get to my email by way of the website. You've got an address uh, on that sheet. A lot of the information you might be looking for is on that website. So if you would like to stay now and ask us any questions, you're very welcome. If you would like to get in touch by email at any time, as James says, you're very welcome. Those of you who are already studying at the university, you know where our corridor is now. You can just wander along and um, knock on the door. We are open already for applications for next September. Um, I would say if you want to apply for entry next September, do so before Easter if you can. It's, there's no charge for applying, which some universities apply. And if you change your mind, it's no problem. It's just much easier for the whole system if we have an application from you early in the year. Um, there's always the, the possibility that the university will decide at some point, say next June, next July, that we've got enough students now, thank you, and they'll close the system. And they don't give us any warning of that. So uh, it's a good idea to get an application in early. And if you then change your mind, you don't want to come, that's a very easy uh, application to cancel. But don't leave it too late, because the university may um, close the lists. It's a fairly straightforward application. 
certainly at master's level, PhD, you have to demonstrate a bit more before you um, can complete your application process. At master's level, there's a very straightforward form. We ask you to write uh, a statement about why you're interested and what you think you would hope to learn during the year with us, and you need some academic references. But it's a fairly straightforward thing. We then usually try to meet you and have a chat and make sure that we're um, the right program for you. So uh, we will look forward to seeing some applications from you. In the meantime, just come and talk to us um, if ever you need to. Any questions about any aspect of what we talked about today? Funding, what it's like, what, how many books you need, any sort of uh, question, you're very welcome to come and ask. And um, as I say, meet Elizabeth and Jeff around now. There's loads of biscuits still, so um, you can stay, you can go, um, and we look forward to hearing from you in the future. Thanks very much for coming.